A very warm and cordial welcome to our guests that are here with us this morning. If you're looking, this maybe perhaps join a Christian church, a Seventh-day Adventist church in the area. I'd like to encourage you to consider the Moreno Valley Seventh-day Adventist Church as your next home family. Some of the nicest, warmest, multicultural people you're going to find anywhere in the Inland Empire. What an honor it is to be part of this congregation. To our members for your faithfulness, God bless you. Thank you for your talents, for the treasure, for resources, for all that we do together. In Spanish, we have a saying, sumando multiplicamos. By each of us adding, we actually multiply. So again, we hope that you feel at home today. And to our guests watching here via uh, online services, thank you, Brother Jesse, for your ministry here in our church that allows all these services to be uh, video streamed live as well as recorded. Once it's recorded, it lasts forever. So what a blessing it is. Um, Pastor Bell and I have been talking these last couple of months on the book of John, and it's fallen unto me my assignment for this morning to present to you John chapter 15, a title that uh, the secret key to all life success. We all want success in our lives. Nobody starts out a business enterprise to close it down. Nobody starts a marriage to end up in divorce. No one starts with children to lose them along the way to what this world has to offer. All of us start with a born desire to bring to the maximum expression of whatever it is we are involved with to a successful, at least what we would determine to be a successful outcome. In the world today, we have a lot of great success gurus, business coaches, life success coaches. I can tell you uh, great authors like John Maxwell, uh, Jim Rohn, uh, Brian Tracy, Bob Proctor, uh, Zig Ziglar, that picture you see right here, the books of uh, Tony Robbins and all his great videos. My man, Grant Cardone, if you're involved in real estate investment like I am, uh, you, you want to look at some people. Success leaves clues. And they've written books and seminars. Uh, Chicken Soup for the Soul series. That, uh, that'll help you out there. You got Canfield right there. And some other great Sharma and other great uh, people. And, and, and they have the wisdom of the world. And it works. Because it taps into sources of the spirit realm. It taps into sources of, of you being in mindset at that moment, tapping into infinite source. They'll have different names for God, the universe, infinite source, or some even would say God, like John C. Maxwell. You know, whatever it is that you're looking for success in your life, the Bible has already declared the master key. The key that will unlock each and every ambition, desire planted by God himself in your heart for you to achieve to its maximum expression for your benefit, your bank account, your health, your love with your family, but for his smile, for his glory. Because my Bible still says that God delighteth in the prosperity of his servant. So with this in mind, it's gonna, we're going to put aside all the audio books and all the DVDs and the good stuff that you have there. And I'd like to share with you right now Jesus' secret key to success. He sums it all up without having to say a word. I'm going to show you right now what is success in your life with the following picture. I hope it is forever tattooed into the recesses of your soul. Here it goes. Are you ready? This is what success looks like. Success is fruit. More fruit. Much fruit. The fruit that remains. The fruit where you can eat. The fruit that God can eat and be satisfied. How that looks, that is your bank account. That is your health. 
Those are your relationships. That's from God's vantage point. What He wants to see in your life. That His joy in you would be full. Success. Is God's smile. He smiles. And you can live for the rest of your life from just one smile of heaven. Success. So the key, the master key to all success, Jesus leaves the clues in John chapter 15. Let's read together starting at verse 1. When Jesus said, I am the vine, and my Father is the husband. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide. Ten times the word. Abide in me. And I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I repeat again. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me. Hallelujah. And I abide in him. The same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and man gather them and cast them into the fire, and they're burned. But if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask whatever ye will, and it, that which you asked, shall be done not by you, shall be done unto you. Behold, the key, the secret key to all life success is God doing for you what you can never do for yourself. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's put on our spiritual seatbelts because here we go. Because when you say yes, God says, I'm happy. In this is my Father glorified. In that you bear much fruit. And that's how you show you're my disciples. Today, four, four quick points. Point number one, Jesus said, I am the vine. And not just the vine, he says, I am the true Point number two, my husband, my my father is the husbandman, the vine dresser. He's cutting away stuff that doesn't belong to the branches. Point number three, you are the branches. Branches don't produce fruit. They bear fruit. Not produce it. The elements... The sap, the stem, the vine produces the fruit, not the branch. The branch just remains. And through it, fruit is produced by the vine. Hallelujah. And what is produced? Fruit. Let's talk about those four points today, starting with Jesus says, I am. He starts with, I am, why? For one specific reason, he is God. I am that I am. Tell them, I am has sent you. Jesus says seven times, I am, in the book of St. John. First time we see that there in John 6, 35, when he says, I am the bread of life. A couple of chapters later, I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And now we come to the seventh time. Jesus has now finished washing the disciples' toes and feet. They just finished eating the, the meal, the last supper. 
The last verses of the previous chapter 14, he says, now let's leave, let's get out of here. He's about to die a few hours from here. Judas is going to kiss him in his beard. He's going to be betrayed. He's going to be hung naked on a cross to die. People's famous last words, maybe on a deathbed, those are the most important words because they, they know the moment is coming to the end and they sum up everything. Every word is measured. The most important thoughts that they could leave behind in their legacy for those that they love. And what does Christ do? He, he, he gives people a metaphor. Jesus says in a simple way, I am the true vine. By this metaphor, it's not the first time the Bible talks about metaphors. In the Bible, there are different metaphors. For example, fathers and children. God wants to show you how we relate to him by what we know, fathers and mothers and children. He gives those illustrations. A few moments ago, we just read, he is the good shepherd, the relationship of a sheep to the shepherd. And that's how a metaphor he, he gives us today, a special metaphor. He's talking about an intimate intimacy between the vine, the branches, what's done to the branches to produce fruit, much fruit, and more fruit that remains. First and foremost, Jesus says, I am the true vine. That is, there is a false one. Out there in the Old Testament, the Bible says that God planted Israel as a fertile vine. And uh, the vine grew, but we know what it ended up producing, produced sour grapes, the Bible says. So God planted another vine. Jesus said, I am the true vine that God has planted on earth. Jesus, who has no beginning, no end, who was not human before. He was spirit. He became human when he reduced himself to a seed in the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost comes down to earth and places that seed close to the fallopian tube of a 14-year-old Palestinian girl sleeping right there in the corner of some dark little hut. And then the baby begins to grow. Nine months later, 15 years old, she's pushing, and out comes eight pounds, umbilical cord attached, breaking water and blood. God. For great is a mystery of godliness. God became flesh. Father planted the vine, not Israel, but now the true vine of which the whole economy depended on. The true vine for Christ is the source of life. The Bible says in John 1 that Behold, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Nothing that has been made would have been made without Him. Jesus says, I am the source. Being connected to that source, therefore, allows us to live with Him in intimacy. Think about the vine, how it's planted. I used to sell vineyards when I was a broker, uh, a commercial broker in real estate up in the Fresno area. And to know the craft, not just enough just to know how to sell a commercial vineyard. But I'd also get up there early in the morning with the Latino people, and they would do what they call la pisca. Pisca means that they're, they're, they're doing the pruning, they're, they're doing the, the, the harvesting, they're tying it up for, uh, they're nourishing it. And it's incredible the type of work that is done out there in the Fresno area for these vineyards. They were not table grapes, they were not wine grapes, they were what we would call raisin grapes. It's an incredible process, a billion-dollar industry. And you plant those vineyards, and it takes three to four years for anything to come up with a fruit. But what's happening during that time? Those roots are going down deep. Those roots are spreading out themselves, and they are gathering nutrients from the soil from the fertilizer, from the watering, from the, the sun. And these, these nutrients are coming in through the roots and becoming this honey type of sap. And it produces it so that it pushes up the sap, pushes up the sap, pushes up the sap. 
And the sap that's inside the stem begins to manifest itself and express itself and there's no other means of expression that by the end of the trunk being the vine, it produces leaves and from the leaves produces little branches. The branches are really, really small. And from those branches, you start seeing a whole bunch of little dots. And as the vine brings the nutrients in, the little dots become bigger and bigger, and you give it some good elements, sun, water, fertilizer. The root sustains the fruit, not the other way around. Your Bible says there in the book of Hosea, chapter 14, verse 8, of me is thine fruit found. You never saw a branch producing fruit. The branches do not produce fruit. They bear fruit. Who produces the fruit is the vine. And as they are in the vine, so the sap naturally. Have you ever seen your fig, leaf, your fig tree or your apple tree, your pear tree? Have you ever seen those branches struggling? I'm going to bloop, produce a fruit. Is that what they do? Have you ever seen them shaking and saying, I got to produce a bloop? They don't do that. They're calm and collected because the branch knows I don't produce. I'm not meant to produce. All I'm meant to is bear. That's not my department. That's somebody else's. All I do is I remain. I abide. I'm hanging out. That's the key to all success, that it is not your success. It's God's success through you as we are dependent and one with the vine. There is a fruitful living that takes place, and I will say there is a little bit of hurt and pain. Let's talk about this now as Christ introduces us to his father. He says, I am the true vine. It's not Israel. I am the true vine. Of me is your fruit. I am the root cause of the fruit. It's not even called your fruit. It's called the fruit of the Holy Ghost. But my father, my father is involved with me. There's energy between me and my father. And through me, he's pruning you. Think about this thought. Because I did my Bible study, Pastor. I did my Bible study this week. And before we read this verse, I hope that you put on new glasses. Here it goes. I am the vine. You are the branches. My father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit. Hello? That's an oxymoron. It's impossible for a branch in him not to bear fruit. The only way a branch in him does not bear fruit is if the branch has been plucked out and it fell to the ground. And there it is becoming darker and brown and withering and producing nothing. Because if it's in him, it's producing. Not the branch. Jesus is producing. The branch is bearing. But if it's not in him, it's on the floor. So follow me closely. Look at this Greek word. It's going to bless your socks off. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, I mean, it's not connected to me, the Father taketh away. And, you know, if you read that too quickly, it kind of sounds like the Father's just going to say, kick it, move it out of the way, you are useless. No, 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 no. I took my little Greek lexicon out. Do you know what the word taketh, the word away is in Greek? It's called idol. The Father idol it away. Idol. What does it mean, idol? It means to pick up. It means to elevate. 
Literally, it means to pick up from the dust. God is not saying, if you're not perfect, stub your toe, made some wrong choices, you made a left when you should have made a right. Father says, sorry, you are use useless. You're out of here. No. It's the same thing that Jesus said. The Son of Man, he's acquainted with grief. He has a PhD in pain. He would see a little ember on his last little fire. Instead of quenching it, he would pick it up and he would and make it grow into more fire. He said, it's like the young kids playing a flute. They would take it from the reeds growing in the river. They'd cut it off, and they'd make the holes, and they'd begin to play it until the reed began to crack open, and now you don't have a good tune. And what would the young people do? they throw it on the ground. Jesus would idle the flute, pick it up, take it to the carpenter shop, make it work again, rebuild it, and then he would say, look what we can do with this again and make a beautiful symphony. My Bible says the Father picks up idols, levitates, elevates that which is down, and he grafts it back in so that it may bear fruit. But to do this, he purges it. Again, another Greek word, katairo. And we know this, those in the medical field, catharsis. It's a purging. It's a cleansing from within. And the purpose why God the Father, the husbandman, takes the knife to cut away the suckers, those, those parasites, those strange and alien branches that have nothing to do but just steal away the sap so that it limits the fruit Father says, you don't belong in that person's life. Psh. Fentanyl. You don't belong in that person's life. Psh. Cocaine, heroin. You don't belong in that person's life. Psh. And there's a father. That illicit relationship, you don't belong there. Psh. That depression, that root of bitterness, you don't belong there. Father is using a knife. And this knife, you are clean through the word that I have spoken. Father uses the power of the washing of the word to katharas, to, to remove and purge that which once belonged to you. I've said this many times before, I used to smoke. In the morning when I'd get up, instead of prayers, I'd light up. First thing I'm checking is, where, where's, where's, where's the smoke? I was happy, where's the smoke? I'm sad, I'm nervous, I was part of my neurological being. I was looking for it. And you too. Don't be all looking at me funny. I got my stuff, you got yours. Let no one think himself to be that holy, for only God is holy. Amen. Okay? Now, if he was able to get that out of my life, he can get whatever gunk you're going through right now out of your life. Amen. But this is a church where it's a hospital. Amen. We come as we are. Just, we're just asking, don't, don't smoke marijuana in the temple. There's a no smoking side outside. You can come here high. You can come here with cocaine on your nose. Whatever it is, just come here. This is a hospital. We'll help you get cleaned up. The Holy Ghost does not mind getting dirty with your mud. That's not an issue. The issue is abide. Stay. Let the sap bring life. Let him produce what you could not produce. Just bear it. Bear it, baby. Just bear it. That's all you got to do is bear it. 
It's his fruit called the fruit, Galatians 5, the fruit of the Holy Ghost. You know, love, joy, peace, all those good words. But it's done through the word and the application of the word because it is that word that is sharper than a two-edged sword, cuts on this side and cuts on the other. That word begins to purify our thoughts, scrub our motives, cleanse our consciences, and begins to produce a new identity because the branches in the vine says, all I am is what I know. I'm a God fruit bearer. Yeah, you, may, you may be a doctor, you may be a politician, you may be a realtor, you may be a business owner, truck driver. Uh, yeah, but that's not who you are. You are a branch in the vine. Amen. You are a God fruit bearer. That produces a new identity. Look at the knife. Look at that knife. It's the word of God applied correctly that Father uses to take away that which doesn't belong in your life. But why would Father do that? So that his joy would be made full in your life. Amen. So that your joy may be full. Amen. Why do we go looking for love in all the wrong places? Because we're looking for that joy. Did you know that there are pleasures at his right hand forevermore? Amen. Did you know that the joy of the Lord can become your strength? Amen. That we can become addicted to the joy of the Father Amen. and do the things that the Father wants and the things of this world will grow strangely. Because when you were at the party, you were at the nightclub, it was just right here. You had it right here. But now you're, you're putting some stuff in the middle. You're putting Bible and, and Bible and more word. And now you're listening to Christian music. And now you're, you're coming to church. You're joining a Bible study. Now maybe God is calling you into the ministry. Whatever it is that God is doing. But you're putting distance. Those things of the world become strangely. I don't know how to identify it. But before, I used to love some things that today are meaningless. There is no need. They, don't, they do produce joy, but of the joy that hurts in the morning. Because what happens in Vegas doesn't stay in Vegas. Brothers and sisters, there is a plague of STDs in this world today that is killing people with cancer. Oh, it's verifiably true. Amen. And I'm not going to get into statistics and all that stuff. I think I will. One out of every four males on planet Earth carries the HPV virus that affects women and cervical cancer and cancer resulting in the head and the neck. And to them, it's going to become cancer as well. 340,000 women worldwide die just out of HPV. Looking for love in all the wrong places. I'm serious about this. When there is joy with the Father. So that's what I'm trying to say is things that don't belong in your life. And Father loves you. Look how Christ learned. Who in the days of his flesh, Hebrews 5, verse 7, he offered up prayers, supplications, with tears unto him that was able to save him from death. And he was hurting that he feared. Although he was a son, yet he learned obedience. How? By the successes? By the multiplication of the fish and the loaves and walking on water and all? No. He learned by suffering. I don't know about you, but I learned a lot more and a lot faster through suffering and pain than through success. The question is, how much pain do you have to bear 
so that you can realize the mud of the world is not the living waters of God. Brothers and sisters, let's make a decision today. We are God fruit bearers. He produces it, not me, not my, not, not my department. All I'm going to do is remain. All I'm going to do is abide. I am, after all, a branch. What does a branch know? The branch knows that it depends on the vine for its sustenance. It depends on the vine for its life. It, it believes that it is a branch, not a vine. Please, stop trying to earn your salvation. It's not what you do. It's what's been done. We don't produce fruit. We bear it. I, I, I want to say it as oftentimes until it comes into your soul. By means of connection. Connection deals with intimacy. I in them. You in me. That we all may be one. And Adam knew his wife. And the two became one. It's a different thing to say, abide with me. That's not the commandment. It's abide in me. I'm going out with my girlfriend and take her out to a movie, take her out to a dinner. And at the end of the day, I'm going to give her a handshake. I am with my girlfriend. But then we get married, and now we have intimacy. The difference between being with, and if that's how you want your relationship with Christ, come to church every so often, maybe read the Bible or not. Hey, well, I don't know, I'm going to keep him at a distance. I'll be just with him. Well, well, that's at least you're with him. That's good. Good, good, good. But Jesus says, abide in. In is not with. In has intimacy, connection. This is done through prayer, through, through Bible study, and that gives evidence of fruitfulness. Amen. Fruit can be seen. And fruit does not eat itself. The only time fruit eats itself is if it goes rotten. Fruit is for the pleasure of someone else. This is what Christ is calling us to. Intimacy that brings fruitfulness and pruning that hurts. It's by what we suffer, what things that we let go of. Jesus still did say, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Your cross was not meant to tickle you. Your cross was meant to kill you. We are called to die. And in that intimacy to have unity with him. And when the Christ in me meets the Christ in you. Now we're one too. I don't know if you've seen how the branches grow, but they begin to intertwine and they go with themselves. And now we form what Jesus says. He didn't say, I am the vine, you are the branch. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Plural. This is the unity of the church. And he still remains faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of the whole mess down to the recesses. That's what the sap does. It goes in the inside. And just like we understood here, Jesus said, you are the branches 
we are bringing fruits. Fruit bears the characteristic of the tree that it's part of. Jesus said it best. <laughs> Don't expect oranges from an apple tree. Amen. If you planted a fig tree, don't expect lemons. The fruit is an outward expression that is visible, that can be seen of the root. Again, Hosea 14.8, of me is thine fruit found. I am the vine because I am the root. Follow me. You are not the root. The root cause for your new identity is Jesus. The root cause for your fruit bearing is Jesus. It's humbling to know we don't participate, we yield. We don't produce, we remain. Yes, when you crack the book open, you're remaining. As you are dependent and you fall on your knees to know where do I go, to the left or to the right, you are remaining. As you interact with other believers and you're helping them grow, you are remaining. Apart from me, ye can do nothing. Fruit is visible. You can see it. And fruit exists for the benefit of somebody else. To finish, Jesus Christ said, abide. Ten times. Abide in me, I in you. As a branch can't bear fruit by itself unless it's grafted into the vine and has a sap from the roots, the stem, neither can you if you don't stay in me. What does it mean to abide? Jesus is not inviting you to be a visitor. To visit. He's inviting you to stay over forever. He wants you to be an abider, not a visitor. Have you ever had some good tea? There's different ways of having tea. Tea. You, um, you can dip it up and down and then kind of, you know, maybe get the spoon afterwards, press it maybe with something else, and out comes what was in the little pouch. Some people are dippers. I don't know. Other people are just soakers. And they just put that tea bag straight down in there and just let the warmth of the water naturally take out the elements that were meant for your enjoyment. Like washing plates after potluck. You could try scrubbing them from nothing and it's going to be there. Or just let it soak in hot water and the gunk comes off easier when you soak it a bit. Don't be a dipper. Be a soaker. Stay underwater. Stay in Christ. Be part of what he wants to wash away. Difference between abiding with Christ and abiding in Christ. Let's talk about abiding with Christ. A couple of good illustrations before we finish. You're sitting in your bed before you go to sleep. It's so important what you do before you go to bed because you begin to write that in your subconsciousness. The first thing, once you enter into REM sleep, rapid eye movement, try to take inventory. Take inventory of what happened that day. No good, no bad, no judgment. No time for repentance or, 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 or patting yourself in the back. Just think objectively. How did a day go today? Where, were, where was I able to give God the glory? And he smiled. Where did I do a wrong turn? And he picked me up again. Very important. Take inventory. Listen. Listen through his word. Listen through prayer. In the morning, first thing in the morning, before you put your feet on the earth, thank him. Be someone who's grateful because he produces in you what you could not produce yourself. Be grateful for the opportunities for life. Let the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable unto you, O God, this day. 
Say those words before you put your feet on the ground. And try to still, still yourself. Breathe. It's incredible, the power of breath, to be able to still yourself and your emotions and to, instead of living in the foamy crest of waves coming back and forth of emotions, go deep. Go deep in the morning. God is in the deep. Go deep where he, his presence can sustain you and quiet your soul before, before you hear all those barking dogs and horses of all the emails and news and getting ready the kids for school. you got to quiet yourself. That's you with Christ, but to remain in Christ, you must be born again. You can't abide in Christ if you're not in Christ to begin with. And the only way we are in Christ, follow me closely, we're about to be done, is to understand how God the Father and the energy He has with God the Son, if I am in Him, that energy is mine. How God the Father loves God the Son, because I am in Him, because you are in Him by faith. That's how He loves me. How God the Father treats God the Son because we're in Christ. That's how he treats us. To be in Christ is a spiritual, intimate relationship. You're not going steady. You're not going on a date. You are married with God. That's the intimate Jesus. How we do this? you got to surrender. Look, you're going to have 10 15, 30 times a day, opportunities each and every day for you to say, uh uh. In other words, learn to say no. Don't learn Hebrew and Greek, just learn no. Keep you out of tons of trouble. Surrender means, uh uh. Not my will, but your will be done. Yielding means, um, I'm not going to move, I'm not going to answer that way. I'm yielding. Somebody else is doing it for me. You did say I'm in the vine and I got the sap, so you produce the fruit. I'm just, I'm just going to bear it. Sometimes you just got to bear it. This is the face that it looks like when you're bearing it. Here you go. Really? Ready? <laughs> That's extremely spiritual, believe it or not. Because, you know, you don't want to act that way, but... You have to. And it's not that it's you, really. You're giving it to the Lord. And at the beginning, it may be like that. But by practice, it's like, Lord, you're in control. You are in charge. I'm not worried about tomorrow. I know who holds my tomorrows. That's very simple. you got to deny yourself, negate yourself, and follow me. Jesus did it. He wants to do it through you. And to finish... I think this is the most important part. I think of all my sermons this year, this next minute may be the most important of all. It's through the word. You've got to crack the book open. Amen. On your phone, on your watch, I don't care how you do it, on the real book, on your tablet. But when you read, what you read is called graphe in Greek. It's the written word. When you process what you're reading, it's called logos. Ology, zoology, biology. The ology, logos, it's the understanding of the word. But there is a third word. It's called rema. And rema is when the spirit of the letter leaps out and you don't read the Bible. Mm -mm. The Bible reads you. And you're saying... Holy moly, guacamole. What? Let me, re let me call Pastor Bell. What does this verse mean, Pastor? Because I, I got convicted of the Holy Ghost. And then the, you're starting to see some stuff about you in that word that you're saying. And the spirit begins to nourish your spirit. And it ends up saying, baby girl, you're a princess. Princesses don't go there.
Son, you are a, a, a prince. Princes don't treat princesses like that. And you're like, oh, I'm a prince. I'm a princess. And you begin to live out the fruit of God, bearing it for your benefit, for his glory. It's for his glory. Now, to finish, here's the key. If you abide in me, my words abide in you, I'll be your Aladdin. Ask whatever you will, and it shall be done unto you. Something's going to be done unto you. Follow me closely. I love Sister White's comment in Heavenly Places, page 55. Be blessed. He will freely bestow all blessings connected with himself. So you're never going to be asking God, Oh, Lord, Powerball, lotto, lottery, $100 million. That's at least $10 million for the church, Lord. Oh, what I could do, Lord Jesus. Just No, 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 no. You're not going to ask that. Because in your intimate relationship with Christ, you're going to identify what blessings are connected with Him. And you're going to ask for every blessing that's connected with Him. And when that blessing that's connected with Him is identified and asked for, because in that you feared, because you remained, because you honor his words, he will honor your word. Amen. Ask what ye will of all blessings associated with him. And he, not ten ways to close a deal, he, not because of your education or pedigree, he will do it to you. In this is my Father glorified. So I ask you as we finish, do you want just a regular experience with Jesus or do you want it supersized? <laughs> you get to order and you say, I want it supersized. You could have the little bloop fruits or you could have those big two men carrying out of Canaan. Big old uh, grapes, God says, according to your faith, so may it be done unto you. Behold, the secret key to all life success. And what a better hymn to sing right now than abide with me. Let us be upstanding right now as we sing this hymn. Let's do it singing with all of our hearts, all of our minds. We'll come back for a benediction, a final word. And let's thank